Hello, I'm your host, Walter Schwabe, and here we are, Gov2, another Thursday afternoon, and bright and sunny out here in the Sherwood Park and Edmonton region, uh, and it's frankly about time, as, uh, you know, essentially we've been having nothing but rain here uh, recently. Um, now today I'm joined by Chris Moore, who's the Chief Information Officer for the City of Edmonton, just a little bit to the west of our Fuselogic TV studios here. Chris, how are you today? Fantastic. Enjoying the weather, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, you know, the uh, I didn't expect, and I don't think anybody really expected to get as much rainfall as we have in this area for a while. And, you know, you always kind of worry about droughts because we've had some years of droughts in the in the last little while. But uh, now it's it's almost on the opposite side of things. I think we've had enough, enough rain uh, for probably the rest of the summer. We haven't had much of a summer yet. Not yet. Just last night, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. One evening. Uh, lucky to have it, I guess. Uh, well, you know, uh, Chris, you know, uh, uh, for the folks uh, tuning in and watching uh, the show, you know, Chris is, uh, is a client of ours here at Fuse Logic and, uh, and, a, and a dear friend. And we've had a lot of fun over the last uh, year and a bit, I would say, um, doing some interesting projects in and around the greater Edmonton area. And I, I wanted to have Chris on the show earlier when we launched the show. Uh, but unfortunately, I mean, Chris is uh, not not only a man about town, but literally a man about the world. Uh, his travel schedule is uh, is really uh, stacked with all sorts of interesting projects, which we and events. And so, I hope to get some of the uh, those stories out of today's show, Chris. Um, now, wh what's the the most recent event that you attended? I think was it one back east here in Canada, or was there another one that you went around the world on somewhere on? Uh, so this year, I'm really trying to focus a lot of my energy at home. There's a lot of great things happening in Edmonton and, and Alberta and Canada as well in the whole Gov 2 front. But I think the, the last thing that I was at actually last uh, Wednesday and Thursday was a joint conference that the City of Edmonton IT and the University of Alberta IT put on called Technocon. And this is the second year in a row that we've done. And it's really, you know, over the years, there's been tighter and tighter budgets around training. And when there's budget cuts, usually... Training and travel gets cut first, so uh, we actually partnered with the university. They've got some beautiful facilities, and and we we bring speakers into town, keynote speakers and topical speakers, and it's it's a really cost effective way and also a very innovative way to to uh, to help people understand what's happening with technology. Uh, but prior to that, I guess the the week uh, week before, I was at the National Information and Privacy Conference, uh, which which is just in Edmonton, and. Um, the, the last trip I was on uh, outside of the country would have been back in March. I was in Paris speaking at a, a Microsoft Open Government event because uh, Open Government, Open Data is, is just kind of launching off in, in France right now. Right. So let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that, uh, you know, you've had the opportunity, uh, Chris, to meet with people in various countries around the world, bringing the sort of the, the, the city of Edmonton's open government message and the things that you're doing here locally, but also, I would assume, learning from those various jurisdictions and the things that they're doing and, and maybe trying to draw some of that intelligence and, and insight back here to the local region. What's one of the stories that sticks out in your mind the most in terms of one of those opportunities to learn? Well, for me, one of the biggest things, and you're, and you're right, things are happening kind of differently all around the world. Um, and, and there's learnings for everybody kind of both ways. But one of the things that I'm watching with great interest in Europe mostly is the whole concept of participatory budgeting. And in North America and Canada, we, um, our, our government budgets are really managed by the, the councils or the elected officials and what they're doing in Europe. And I think, you know, because of the strain on money and the economic times there, they've actually started processes using technology to allow people to participate in voting for budget items. And I have no idea how they do it. I don't know what the complexities are or the politics are, but I really believe that, that that's going to come to Canada soon. Uh, and I'm, I'm watching it and, and trying to understand, you know, the um, kind of lessons learned and, and some of those things. Well, you know, Brazil has been a leader in, in participatory uh, budgeting and, uh, uh, as you pro as you're probably well aware already, and so it's interesting you bring that up because I I, I think that would be really interesting to have that happen up here in Canada. Um, so in the one of the uh, the key things that uh, was there anything that you want to share uh, from the the France trip um, that uh, was 
something that maybe was unexpected? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I Microsoft asked me to come there to talk about what we were doing with open data and, and OGDI and, and some of their platforms. But um, I had an opportunity to connect with uh, uh, Lionel Marchand, who's my counterpart at the city of Paris, and also uh, to meet with uh, Severin Nodet, who was appointed earlier this year by the French prime minister to create the whole uh, French open government portal. And uh, I spent some time with him in the prime minister's office there and um, they're actually quite concerned as a country. They think they're really falling behind, uh, and um, you know others are are running ahead. But what I said to what I said to them was, every country or every every city or jurisdiction that enters this space, they bring something new and different and, and unique for the whole community. So I said, uh, you know, don't don't be concerned that you're coming late to the party. You're really not. And um, you know their challenge in in their in you know in their organization is to to get all of the different levels of government and government agencies together to figure out how to release data. Um, I made a comment at the Microsoft event. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of what I call an open ecosystem, and, and what that means for us is the city should share information as we are, but not always believe that we have to create all the systems to deliver the information. So your organization and others takes open data, creates apps, and, you know, if if uh, Tim Hortons can make money selling donuts at 84 cents or whatever it is, I, I hope people can make money selling apps at 99 cents. You have to sell a lot of apps, as you know. Um, but the, the 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 comment I made was, we are moving more of our uh, public data to our data catalog, and we're, we're actually working. Edmonton is leading the way with Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa to create some standards and actually work on a pan-Canadian uh, open data a framework for the country. I, I challenge France to get to that same level because we have software developers here who would love to have standards and sell applications to their people using their data. And right. so, you know, spending time with them, it just reinforced to me that, that um, you know, it's a small world. You know, if we can get some, some standards around data, it becomes a very small world. And it allows a software developer, you know, in his office or in his home in Edmonton or, or anywhere else in North America, really to be selling apps all around the world. Absolutely. You're exactly right. And let's let's talk a little bit about, you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the, the pan-Canadian effort. Um, are you referring to Code for Canada or, or is, is something uh, related to that underway? Can we see some of that uh, shortly? Now that we've got you on full screen, I look behind you there and I can see, uh, you know, the reflection of the buildings uh, from your office there. And, and it's uh, it looks like it's a beautiful day downtown. Um, but uh, are we talking Code for Canada? Well, we, I, had, I had made some commitments about a year ago to, to create a Code for Canada, similar to the U.S. model Code for America. And um, I guess, you know, from what I've observed, we're not ready yet. I mean, what we've been doing with other cities across the country and other levels of government is really figuring out how to work well together uh, on, on things that are really important on this whole movement right now. And so um, I think the first thing that you're going to see out of this group is a new... A new a, a new uh, data sharing license. Um, we adopted the one that Toronto adopted, that Vancouver adopted, that Nanaimo created. Um, but w we are really looking to uh, to some of the other provinces uh, uh, in the country who are working on more of a PDDL license, like they have in the UK. And so I think licenses licensing is is really important to get that figured out and and for us to be in a, a better place after that. And after we figure out how to work together as jurisdictions and other things can come like standards, and then I think eventually one day, you know, shared code or code development or um, some kind of an agency that's going to work together. But we're, I think it, it's, we're trying to figure out how to work together on the things that, that are important and make sense. And then once we have our relationship, tackle some of those bigger challenges. So. Was that the same approach that uh, our friends to the south in the United States took with Code for America? Did they go through the licensing step and the uh, uh, those kinds of steps first? No, I, I don't believe so. And I, I think licensing was really figured out um, kind of individually, and then they shared some information. The, the, the U.S. model is, is slightly different. In I mean, Code for America has had some success because they've had uh, people who are philanthropically prepared to support them financially. Um, we have people in Canada with money, and we have people in Alberta with money in Edmonton. The challenge is is that 
you know, those of us in government and, and technology really need to help the people with the capital understand the value of investing in technology. So there's a lot of money tied up right now in the West in energy, oil and gas and that. And, and that's great, and that's been a huge part of our economy. But uh, a lot of us are trying to move to the knowledge economy, and it's a different risk model. So I think if we can, if we can tap into some investment capital, then um, then we can fund you know some of those projects. Right. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, we talked about some of the things that uh, you might have learned on your travels uh, around the world. Last year, you had the opportunity to uh, to travel to. Uh, uh, Asia and also uh, to Australia. Was there anything significant coming out of there? I mean, I'm sure you learned lots and met a lot of great people. Um, but tell us that, you know, France is just at the beginning of this evolution. And, and as you say, and rightfully so, you know, don't feel like you're late to the party. You're just, you're you're here and, and part of the, the overall picture, which is great, because that's really the choice. Do you participate do you, or, or not? And, and if so, you know, what do you do if you're going to go forward? Uh, but let's talk about some of these other the, the other jurisdictions around the world and what you uh, experienced on the ground there. Um, do they have that same sense of feeling like maybe they are late to the party or they're leading the charge? I know Australia, I mean, doing incredible things down there. But you had an opportunity to meet with uh, Senator Kate Lundy at one point, didn't you? Uh, she was actually off the day I was there, but I, I spent some time with uh, Pia in her office and some of the other folks. Pia Wog. Actually, uh, Pia Wog, yeah. I've actually uh, been invited back, and I'm going to be heading back to Australia to Canberra in September the 12th to the 14th, because FutureGov is partnered with uh, Senator Lundy to put on a, a Gov 2.0 event, um, Congress there. But what, what I learned uh, when I was in Australia was actually that um, the, the New Zealanders really started this whole movement, and then Australia picked up shortly after that. But I think Australia, much like our uh, you know, partners to the south, being a, a larger, you know, a larger country than New Zealand, really um, had a little more momentum and, and got a little more press for what they're doing. But um, and when I look at, so they're absolutely leaders. And you know, when I talk about what we're doing here in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, U.S., U.K. is is really advanced, and and the U.K. I mean, they're releasing um, expenses over a thousand pounds. I mean, that's a lot of details. Uh, and and the huge uh, you know huge move towards transparency in Asia. I, I had an opportunity to be in Seoul and also in Manila. Manila is still dealing with um, uh, you know a lot of the corruption from the past, uh, the Marcos era, and really looking to the technology to allow them to automate. Uh, and because without automation, with manual processes, you get much more uh, corruption and fraud. And so they're really looking for technology to be. Uh, you know, to to help them in in terms of um, anti-corruption, I I was there talking about Gov two O and social media, and really um, a lot of their local government agencies, you know, are not allowing people in in their agencies to use social media and Facebook and that. And, and I said, you have to because your you know your citizens are already having a conversation about what's great for Manila and the Philippines, and you really need to be there, not lurking. You need to be part of the conversation. Um, in, in South Korea, they, uh, they are like a hyper-connected uh, community. And the, the way, you know, the number of mobile phones, the traffic on their phones, uh, and, uh, you know, the apps and that, they, they have different issues. I mean, they, they're, they're dealing with, you know, eGov and Gov2O, but um, that part of the world is a bit of a center for, for hacking and security. So they have a huge focus on, on hacking prevention and, and, and some of that. So. You know, every, everybody is moving in, you know, in a similar direction. They may call it things that are different, uh, but, um, you know, it, it's moving so quickly, too, and the changes in technology. It's a very exciting time to, to be in the space. You know, when you, when you take a look at it, you mentioned, um, you know, summits, uh, future gov summits and things of that nature around uh, the world. And, of course, um, you and I have attended uh, together Open Gov West in Seattle. Uh, I've been to the, the one in, in B.C., you know, we've uh, attended gov camps and things either. In fact, we actually had you on Fuselogy TV when we were doing that work for Microsoft in Ottawa uh, at gov camp. Right. And, and that was another great opportunity to, again, continue to have the story evolve and tell the story as it was at that point in time. 
Um, but I find it interesting, just as I sit back and I listen to the, the various stages of these different countries and the things that they're doing, and uh, it, it's really a fascinating opportunity to take a snapshot of what's going on and the different priorities, maybe culturally or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, what is the common thread that you've experienced across all, all, um, all of those experiences? What's, the, say, the, the thing that you, you, know, you pondered again and said, yeah, you know what, I, I saw or heard that same sort of thing here in Manila, the same in Seoul, the same in, in, in these other jurisdictions like France and so on. What's that common thread that you hear? Well, the, the common thread that I hear is um, citizens want to be more engaged with their city or their country. And, and to me, it's about intrinsic motivation. So um, I think, in, in, you know, I really try to stay away from general or, sorry, generational diversity in some of these conversations. But I really think, you know, you and I, if, you know, in North America, we label ourselves as boomers. Other parts of the world, they don't have all these boomers and millennial labels. But it's really, you know, the, the net generation or the digital generation who are basically saying there is a completely different way to create equity and to provide social justice. They And, and they use the technology. And I think that's putting a huge pressure on, our, our government agencies and cities and countries to um, figure out how to use the technology differently and not in, not in the traditional ways like, oh, let's implement a system that takes two years, it costs millions of dollars, but, uh, you know, in, in unique, innovative and different ways and, and to use the, the power of that you know, viral world and that social media uh, to, um, to, you know, to move things forward. So, I don't know, it's kind of like um, Woodstock with a purpose and an outcome. You know, you know. <laughs> maybe maybe less some of the uh you know the uh the, the <laughs> i was gonna say uh something about uh you know narcotics but we won't we won't go there no, but I, that's I think, you know previous gen or boomer generations or others knew they knew that something had to change and what we were doing was not sustainable but i really think that you know the, the gen x and y's and millennials also know that but they're actually doing something about it and because they know the technology, the technology has just been, been, been part of their oxygen. It's just what they breathe and, and what they use. Right. Well, and you know what? Government has to realize uh, and is and does, I think, realize at various stages of, um, of maturity there in terms of how, how you're right. It, it integrated technology is in, in many people's lifestyles today and how, you know, government might be able to communicate more effectively with citizens and and have those conversations if they embrace these kinds of things. Let's uh, let's quickly just get an update on the re and, and review some of the things here at the City of Edmonton that you've been doing. Um, I'm going to have Evan pull up uh, the website where the open data catalog is, and we can take a look at uh, how many data sets do we have up on the on the site uh, today. I know uh, it's you've been as you mentioned you've been adding all the time. How many do you have out now? I think we're just under 50, which is a pretty small number. Um, we're we're in the process right now of rounding up another seventy data sets, um, and our challenge, you know, we we started in uh, January of 2010, and it was really kind of a soft approach. But what we've now come to realize, people, the, you know, the business units want to put data up, um, but they're not sure how or if. And so, in terms of what's next for open open data and open government for us, is uh, we've got another seventy data sets in the wings. We're actually planning on um, uh, moving our data catalog to a new platform, and we'll be launching that in July. Uh, we haven't announced it publicly, but I'll, I'll do it first here for you. We're actually we're going to move to Socrates platform nice. um, in July, and uh, it gives us uh, many more options, more information, and, and greater vi visualization capability. And we're also working on an open government framework. Um, I wasn't convinced until earlier this year that we needed to, to do something, but Really, what the organization needs are guidelines and, and you know direction, so that when you're developing a new system and you're implementing and there's public data, that it just the default goes to the catalog. We're not you know we're not going around chasing data in the organization, and so that so we're we're excited about the new data catalog, the new data sets, and and our uh, our policy framework in the fall. Well, once again, Gov2 TV here on FuseLogic TV gets another uh, really cool scoop. You know, we've, uh, Chris, we've had three CIOs on in, in a row here now. We've had uh, three weeks ago, we had Bill Schreier from the city of uh, Seattle, who you know, 
And uh, have you met John Walton out of San Francisco, uh, Chris Veen's uh, replacement? I have not, not yet, no. Well, our, uh, last week we had uh, John Walton and Jay Nath, who led the Open 311 initiative down there. And, of course, as you know, the city of Edmonton was prominently listed uh, when they when they announced that. And, uh, uh, and of course, you had uh, several conversations with uh, Chris Veen at the time. Uh, but John and, and Jay were, were terrific on the show. And in all cases now, we've got a little tidbit, a little new new news, new release of information, which was great. Thank you for continuing that uh, that batting a thousand on on new information here on Gov2. Um, you know, Chris, it's been absolutely uh, fantastic, uh, the discussion so far. But before we wrap up here in the next few minutes, I wanted to quickly review transformingedmonton.ca. And then I had a, f- a final question about what a government futurist is. But uh, before we have you answer that question, I want to go to transformingedmonton.ca and just let folks know a little bit more about what the what the, the purpose of this particular blog is and, and how it's been going since you launched it. Well, I mean, we have our main website, edmonton.ca, and a few other sites. Transformingedmonton.ca is really the story about how government is transforming itself, uh, and it's the administration. We have another website called edmontonstories.ca, and those are the stories of Edmontonians and, and their lives. But Transforming Edmonton, uh, if you go on there, you're going to read stories from leaders at the city of Edmonton who are doing innovative things, who are being creative, and, and not just you know doing more with less. These people are literally doing things out of the box and and uh, making change, and and that's what I mean. That's what makes uh, Edmonton such a great city. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I I you know um, I uh, pop into that website every once in a while when I get a chance, and there's always really kind of interesting posts there and, and stuff that's uh, that's cool. And there's been more integration of things like video in the recent while I've noticed, which is really cool too. Of course, you know, obviously we're a big proponent of video here at Fuse Logic. So right. um, now let's uh, talk a little bit about what a government futurist is. On your blog, uh, chrisj-more.com, um, it's a, obviously, a, as every blog is, a work in progress, something that develops. And when I first started my blog back in 2005, it was – you know, what am I going to blog about? What's the theme? What am I, what's the, the tone of my voice and all those kinds of things. But, you know, you mentioned on there that you're a government futurist. Help people understand what that is. Well, it's really somebody who is visioning or seeing what's possible in the future and applying that in a, in a government setting. And so, um, you know, we all, we all hear stories about, oh, this country is doing something fabulous, or that city is doing something fabulous. You, you know, it actually takes leadership, and in my case, it takes support from our executive team and council uh, to uh, you know to move things forward. But it, in essence, what it is, and, and I need I need to write a blog post on that so I can link it and describe it and and, dis, and disruptive leadership too. But what a government futurist is is that somebody who can see forward into the future and who I guess makes predictions about you know where government's going to be. And and for for me, here's an example of that, and I, I can't tell you if this is five years or ten years, but right now when we present our, our budgets at City Council, uh, they're on PowerPoint, they're binders, they're numbers. I think the, in the future, cities will present their budget on Google Earth, and you will see, you know, if you're going to invest in, a, in redeveloping a neighborhood, you can see, you can visualize that on Google Earth, or if you say, Oh, here's a scenario. Let's let's build a bridge over here instead of repairing, you know, those two thousand potholes potholes over there. Then you know the bridge visualizes. So it's really, um, you know, the, the the possibilities of the future. Well, as part of that, as part of that uh, train of thought, um, you know, you had pushed fairly hard for uh, towards. I, th- I you probably started thinking about this well, you know, early at the beginning of last year, or even before, but. Um, you know, virtual worlds and how that might impact the way uh, mm-hmm. people learn about open government and about uh, uh, various things related to that and how they may communicate, come together to communicate on the topic. How is uh, your work in Second Life doing? It's, uh, it's good. Uh, the challenge with our virtual world is there's not a lot of traffic. In, in real Edmonton, there's a lot of traffic and a lot of people. And um, what I'd love to do is build a virtual hockey arena because – Hockey is the most played sports by avatars in Second Life, but for us, it was um, you know showing people the possibility. So we've we've had some conferences there, we've had some different speakers and presentations there, 
Our next work in uh, virtual Edmonton, and we're working with some of our folks in, in community services, is to be able to place in the virtual world um, like a, a, a physical representation of a playground or, or some structures so that your avatar can go and experience it and see it and, and see what it's going to be like when it's built. So I think that's, that's going to provide some value. But for us, I mean, all the things that we're doing around innovation, our move to the cloud, uh, to uh, Gmail and Google Apps, and it, it's all about um, how can we do things differently, how can we create better collaboration, and how can we uh, show up to Edmontonians and to future, um, you know, um, you know, staff and employees as, as a leading city. So beyond, uh, just to wrap up now, beyond participatory, uh, participatory budgets and that kind of thing and how that might evolve here in Canada, is there something else that you got your eye on that maybe for those folks, and by the way, we get, uh, we get folks around the world tuning into this show, uh, not only live but on demand. And in fact, uh, we have uh, some friends and colleagues in, uh, in Brazil at uh, Fortaleza, Brazil, who actually, uh, what they do is they take our shows uh, every week and then they, they translate them into Portuguese for their, for their administrations, uh, uh, folks to be able to watch the show and, and, and learn from it, which I find is, is such a great honor. It's, it's just so wonderful that they're doing that. Um, is, is there something that you're also watching beyond participatory budgets that you'd like to let everybody know who's watching, maybe for some of them to get behind it and, uh, and watch it evolve as well. Well, I think I'm, I'm what I've been watching for the last year, and it's it existed before that, is the consumerization of technology. Is the the rapid development of whether it's devices or whether it's uh, apps, um, and and the way the market shifting. I I really think in the future, um, you know, some of the large systems like uh, PeopleSoft and, and SAP are going to stop being enterprise systems. They're going to become the databases, and, and the apps on our devices are going to be the ERP. Um, so for me, it's it's the whole integration between who we are as people and who we are as employees. And, you know, as, as leaders in IT, we really need to embrace consumerization of technology. We're working on a policy that would allow people to bring their own device. We're looking at providing allowances for people that use their own device. For work, and I know some people are going to say, "Oh, well, you know, you can't do that." Security control, and and um, you know, if you keep showing up like the old IT from the '90s, you're going to be you're not going to be relevant, and you're going to be working, you know, at the hardware store mixing paint. Which I mean, we do need people to do that. But if your goal, if your purpose in life is to is to work in in the IT sector and this and in government, then I mean, your your point is well taken. For sure, absolutely. That uh, you know, we need to evolve, and that's that is. Uh, ever since I've known you, Chris, that's always been the common thread that I take away from our exchanges and our and our chats. And today again has been one, a really uh, terrific one. And uh, I hope you'll agree to come back on the show again in a more regular form as your schedule will allow. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today as well. And and if there was somebody you should. You know, we should have on the show. Please uh, let us know, and we'll we'll hope to get them on as well at, at wherever they are in the world. Uh, but uh, if you're just uh, if you're uh, watching the show and you you maybe tuned in a little late, uh, we've been talking with Chris Moore, who's the chief information officer for the city of Edmonton here in Alberta. And uh, Chris, again, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. Obrigado. <laughs> Uh, once again, folks, uh, tune in Thursday afternoon at 1.30 to watch Gov2, where uh, we will continue to tell the stories of open government and Gov2.0. Uh, we are going to be taking a break in July just for some summer holidays and so on. So, uh, But we're going to be definitely ramping up later in, uh, well, towards the end of the summer, I guess, in August. And uh, hopefully they'll still have great weather uh, as it continues, uh, Chris, in this area. We have a great rest of the, the summer and, uh, folks, if you have any questions or you have show ideas, please let us know. Uh, please uh, do that by going to FuseLogic.tv, or you can certainly reach out and call us at 780-640-9339 and let us know what you think of the show. And also, if you've got uh, maybe somebody you think should be on the show from your jurisdiction, wherever you are watching around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Gov2. Enjoy the uh, rest of the afternoon. Take care.